it's time to engage. Because here we are talking about the Orville episode four yes. versus Discovery episode three. <laughs> The war is on. Now the thing, the thing That's here, excited because I, in Disco- in the episode three, they finally... You finally get to see the Discovery, <laughs> right? Which, this is like, first time for everything, a Star Wars <laughs> show about named after a ship that you don't see until the third episode. Yeah, Star Trek, yeah. Now, there are a lot of reasons that people were saying the third episode is like our second pilot. You're really going to get an idea of what this show is all about. And I've got to say, yeah, it's like the- it... Absolutely was, yeah. and I am. Oh my God! It yeah. delivered as um, as a show that feels like it's moving forward, uh, moving forward into what we'll talk about, yeah. uh, because there are some very um, groundbreaking things in this episode for Star Trek. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about first up. Let's get into the characters. On the Orville, we're dealing with a lot of the same main characters Mm -hmm. in episode four. Mm -hmm. Um, But when we meet a 2,000-year-old derelict massive ship, uh, the ship is filled with some interesting characters as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not the least of which which is Liam Neeson. (laughs) That was was very surprising. I gotta say, like... From a from a casting perspective, I mean, it's Liam Neeson this week, and then next week Charlize Theron's in the in the Orville. Like, are, are you joking? No, man. Oh. This, this, this is the thing. Seth MacFarlane has some favors he can call in. All of these mm. people were in A Million Ways to Die in the West. Yes. So he's bringing in people onto the show that Which are going to attract eyeballs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Liam Neeson was uh, was a really neat addition. Um, I'm expecting Charlize Theron next week to to impress us. <laughs> Well, yeah. she better, because this is the whole point, bringing in these big-name <laughs> guest stars. Uh, whereas on the Orville, oh, we had... Discovery. Um, oh, yes, whereas right. on Discovery, <laughs> um, we also got to meet a whole bunch of new people, yes, because we we're finally on the Discovery. ship yeah. that is going to see us through the rest of the series. So what did you guys think of, of who we met on the Discovery? I thought... That the new captain. Mm-hmm. Um, oh my goodness, Lorca. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Interesting name. Mm-hmm. Uh, a writer's name, and I'm also I'm thinking because I feel like the first two episodes, just as an aside, the first two episodes were like a prologue, and we're at chapter mm-hmm. one now. It, I discovery. would agree. How about yeah, you, Vanya? I agree with that, Sonia. Uh, <laughs> Definitely, yeah. 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 And I, I like. So this new captain, I think, is in line with the different th- the way that Discovery is doing things differently. Because mm. this new captain is um, not the hero. No, <laughs> he's a rogue. He's like a rogue captain. He is um, a little bit. He's a little bit. Uh, there's there's, a, there's a, a dark side to him. There's this, this strange sort of weirdness about him at the end. It's a little bit menacing. Mm-hmm. There's a little bit of menace he's about him. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. And. Uh, and I found that uh, it's, is it Saru. Saru, yeah. Saru, yes. He's in he's in a new role, so that's interesting mm-hmm. to see a, a character in Star Trek change roles. I don't think that happens. Yeah, you see characters in Star Trek get promoted, but they usually keep their job. Or occasionally, <laughs> spin off to another show. Mm-hmm. But in this case, and then we see Burnham, of course. Yeah, the whole thing, the Burnham whole... showing up was interesting in yes. this one. Vanya, what did you think about the characters we got to play with in this episode? Yeah, Lorca, I really like him. Yeah. He's creepy <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good um idea. he's creepy and very like, he seems like very kind of southerny and like a, american and um he yeah he's definitely rough around the red i just he has a bit of like admiral kane bsg kind of going for him you yeah, know yeah a little mm-hmm. like oh, okay we're at war you know and this is different a different game yeah. you know we're not playing the same sort of by the same set of rules which is great to kind of set everything up and push mm-hmm. things forward so you kind of know where he stands um, and also, but all kind of, he's complimentary, manipulative, mm-hmm. and yeah, I, I, but I like him. I like the character, definitely. And I really love Tilly. Oh my like, God. the instant she started to speak, I, I think I put my hands to my mouth and I said, I love her yes. so yeah. much. And thank God, because there's no levity <laughs> because whatsoever. Because I her. don't love anybody else. <laughs> yeah. Well, I kind of, you know, I actually, I do have a soft spot for Burnham. Like, I do love Burnham. Like, and they're, I mean, they're jamming, <laughs> it's the main character. They're jamming Burnham down our throats. We have to like her because yeah. she's the main character. But then they show up with Tilly, who's this, like, silly, lovable, ridiculous... Insecure character, ginger-haired, yeah, and um, 
Yeah, she's in, yeah, she's a little insecure, but it's, it's great for Burnham, like to yeah. play, a, like that's a great character for her to play against. Yeah, and because she's so rough. And yeah, tough. and Sonica was given this um, this role that does not emote very much, mm-hmm. and it's an interesting thing because she's a she acts a bit Vulcan, but she's human, so she is doing something that nobody has ever had to do on Star Trek before, um, and it's it's hard. And I don't know how successful she's been so far, but I think she'll fall into it. Uh, before we get too deep into that, computer, do we have any comments? Derek uh, finds that they've turned Burnham into a character similar to Tom Paris from Voyager, and yep. finds that Tilly is similar to Harry Kim from Voyager. Oh, Bang oh, on. Derek! I actually did say yeah. out loud today that I thought uh, Harry, uh, that Tilly was just like Harry. They almost had the same <laughs> scene. They almost and have the same scene from the pilot of Voyager. Convict, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a similar thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you're, that's a very good instinct. It's nice. It's a similar thing. And the funny <laughs> totally thing is, agree. they really tried at the beginning of Voyager to make Tom Paris into the main character. It was going to be a show about Tom Paris and Janeway. Mm-hmm. And note that Tom Paris is not the main character by the end of that show mm-hmm. because that was a bad idea, poorly executed. I'm hoping that they can do it better with Michael Burnham's character. I'm hoping they they watched some Voyager episodes and they were like, oh, this is where we went wrong with Robert Duncan McNeil's character. And interestingly enough, Robert Duncan McNeil is going to be directing episodes of The Orville this year, oh. which is very interesting. Oh, um, so going back to The Orville for a moment, yeah. the characters that we got to meet on The Orville this uh, in this episode were neat guest stars because they brought us into a... A different way of life. Um, when you come across a giant ship, the people on it you expect to be a little bit um, uh, complicated, and they weren't. Was it for, for you? I thought it was the Borg at first. Because all you saw <laughs> were, uh, um, you, it looked like right at the beginning. Yeah. As you, as, and as right the, angles and yes. geometric things. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's funny. Anyway, that's interesting. The Borg, no. Like so no. much bigger that you don't actually know what it is that's at first. Right. Yeah. That's right. As, yeah. as, they, as they panned out, yeah, yeah you could yeah. tell it wasn't. Um, but maybe it, they wanted us to feel that way. Maybe, was, yeah. The music was ominous. Quite. <laughs> now, the ominous things that were happening inside of this ship with these characters, I found fascinating. Mm. Coming up against a, a dictatorial theocracy. Mm. Man, mm-hmm. if there isn't a better way of examining what's happening in the mm. world today, mm. yeah. holy shit. <laughs> it was so interesting to see that, you know... Looking at anything outside of the world we know is against the rules. You get beaten down for that in a time when science is being ripped off of the White House website. Yes. Like, it, wow. It was really interesting mm-hmm. to, to go into this, especially because we're also dealing with, you know, villains on both sides that mm-hmm. don't believe in science over theology. We've got our, we've got our, like old men in Congress Mm -hmm. who don't think that science is pointing us in the direction of the world's ending climate change. Oh my God, Mm -hmm. we're all going to die. And then you've also got the enemies of the state in the Islamic state where it's like they're living their lives through theology alone. And if you look really hard at what America and ISIS are doing, religion connects all of the ignorance. And to watch this episode go deep into that without ever pointing a finger at a Republican or a, or a militant Islamist terrorist mm-hmm. yeah. and be able to explore this. Like, that is what Star Trek is for. Mm-hmm. And I enjoyed that so much. Yes. Yeah, it yeah, was it definitely huge for was me. your best episode. Um, I well, didn't mind some of the challenges um, that I talked about in our previous episodes about... Uh, the comedy and the mm-hmm. and the drama as much. Yes, um, it, it you seemed know, to get smoother in this episode. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it's almost getting smoother in every episode. Yeah, and I it, is this is a Brandon Braga. Is this the uh, or, no? It was the previous. I think Brandon wrote uh, three. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, he's consulting. He's uh, definitely. Uh, yep. You can tell. Oh, you can really tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can tell. Yeah. Brandon's in that writers' room. Yeah, absolutely. For me, it's it's funny. This episode, I enjoyed. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the sincerity of it. I also mm-hmm. enjoyed the the par- parody aspects of it m- more than the other ones. Yeah. For example, uh, Seth MacFarlane's character, Captain Mercer, he is <laughs> not like any of the other captains. No. And and he, it's delightful to watch him be um, 
it's incapable of certain things, you mm -hmm. know, and, and needs so much support. Needs his team. He's, yeah. yeah. And to also, be, he, he's not the authoritative figure that we're used to mm -hmm. seeing mm -hmm. in, in the cast. But that, it's working. It's really working, especially, it, it was perfectly fine in three and four. Yeah, I thought, it I does seem to be a theme between these two episodes is that the captains are unconventional, unconventional Star Trek yes. captains. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're both unconventional both unconventional but mm -hmm. um they, they have their goals in mind and they're you know they're kind of staying the course but and they, they are, are very different from any other captains but the thing that like. i find um conventional about seth MacFarlane's character as the captain is that he is definitely not the bad guy right oh, yeah. whereas and he's, he's likable yeah, he's like he's like <laughs> yeah. whereas Lorca <laughs> casting Casting Lucius Malfoy <laughs> as your villain, or as your as your captain, means maybe he's a villain even if he smiles the whole time. But when he is going to creepily stalk around a room filled with cadavers of monsters, maybe your captain's not such a good dude. And call for the big animal by saying yeah, "kid kitty, here, kitty, kitty." kitty. Yeah. That was the creepiest part. That was the creepiest I part. But, but I now, like the was there anything? Uh, computer? Is there anything There's... online worth uh, worth mentioning? Derek, ah, <laughs> oh, Derek. In again. <laughs> okay. Found that the most uh, recent episode of the Orville uh, paid homage to Star Trek: The Original Series episode for the world is hollow and I have touched the sky. Yes. Also, tip told. of the hat to the TV show The Star Lost, and paid tribute to Isaac Asimov's Nightfall. So lots of references yes. according to uh, Derek. That's the thing about the people and working Derek. on the Orville. They love science fiction. They love Star Trek, and. I don't know that the people working on Discovery mm. love Star Trek. They fired Fuller, who made Star Trek. <laughs> I did think that today. I, I when I was watching, I, I, I mean, I was watching Orwell again, and I was thinking, yeah, it does seem like they like know Star Trek. Like yeah. they, they really love it. And I did actually think, oh man, do people like? Actually, it was like, do you guys watch Star Trek? You know, when I watched Discovery, like I was like. Guys actually like it, you know? Do you do you love Star Trek? And do you? How well do you know Star Trek? <laughs> yeah, it is is a question that comes into my head because I know there's a huge team of people on Star Trek Discovery whose job it is to make sure that continuity is working in certain ways. But those certain ways are the things that I'm suspicious of, because fungus that makes you warp through the galaxy in no time flat. Because they are the strands of, of living organisms that hold the the galaxies together. Sounds a bit like a transwarp conduit. Yes. But not entirely like a transwarp conduit. And so I'm wondering if this is something that the Discovery will ultimately be doomed to fail at. The ship will be destroyed like the Glen. And the transwarp conduit failure that happens in uh, with, with uh, the Excelsior in the mm. movies winds up being yet another time when transwarp didn't work. You know? <laughs> yeah. Like I don't know, maybe it maybe it comes down to comes down to this being a doomed expedition. But, and that's why we've never really heard of Michael Burnham, Spock's right. frigging si foster sibling. <laughs> like there were certain attempts to jam this stuff into continuity that I think you were telling me earlier could have been totally avoided by placing Discovery in any other timeline yes, other right. than yes. 10 yes. minutes before Star Trek. <laughs> like, 10 minutes before the cage begins <laughs> is going to look a lot like the cage. <laughs> and this doesn't. That's right. And that's a bit weird. I, 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 I did say, like, yeah, you can tell that the people that were, are working on Orwell, like, they really, they're really about Star Trek and science fiction as well. But maybe, like... That's more like for if you want to enjoy the nostalgia of Star Trek, you know what I mean. Yep. So it is really seeped in nostalgia. Like you know, you, I thought of other episodes like Shadow Play or what's that mm -hmm. episode um, with uh, Gosven and all that. You know where Data goes down and yep. like, so there's a lot of those things at play. But I don't know if we want something fresh and new. You know what I mean? Then Orville, the Orville is very much tapping into my like nostalgia. But yeah. Um, the two shows definitely give you two different kinds of yeah. experiences. And and it's not to say that the Discovery is completely ignoring canon. Yeah. Like, there are beautiful little moments where someone is handed a data card, like a, a, like a chip. The yeah. little yellow chips. Those were on the original series. Yes. That's pretty badass. Yeah. <laughs> this episode also played into not even the original series, but the animated series. Mm. In the continuity that Spock's mom read 
Alice in Wonderland to oh, him. Oh, that's yes. right. That was a nice that, Yeah, yeah that, that, and, and like that ties into the cartoon, but it does technically tie into canon. And so I, there's some respect to be found in the fact that they're doing that. Um, but again, those are little sinews connecting it. Yeah. The big muscles are like the ships that don't look anything like mm. a Constitution class vessel mm-hmm. that was flying around at the same time. I mean, even if in the first two episodes there was a Constitution class vessel there that got smoked by the Klingons, <laughs> or if a canine, a Katinga cruiser, yeah. like if a bird of prey, if some, no, they wouldn't have been around yet. But mm-hmm. like if a, an actual Klingon vessel mm-hmm. that we recognized, or a Starfleet vessel that we recognized showed up. I think as fans looking to be wrapped in that Star Trek blanket, right. we would feel like it's there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't feel like it's trying to do that, which is a bold choice. Um, but going back to your question, is it because they even know it? <laughs> or is yeah, it because they see, specifically I, don't want to? Exactly. Are they making that choice like they're really trying to separate themselves from it, but they know it? Or do they just not know it at all? Yeah, and I don't, I don't, I don't know yet. And this is a total rumor. I can either, I cannot confirm this, but apparently <laughs> the reason that Fuller was shown the door is because he didn't like how different looking mm. the show was. Mm. I mean, he's got writing credits on a lot of this stuff mm-hmm. because he was around when early drafts were there. But you can bet this is not what he signed he off on it, yeah. because he left. So, if what was really getting under his skin was the differences mm. that Discovery was having in the execution, in the design. Uh, he's right. It's not, it doesn't look, it doesn't feel like Star Trek. Maybe that's I, on purpose. I'm, I'm wondering if, sorry, uh, I'm wondering if some of the things that we're seeing that are, is, that's connecting us to Star Trek and Discovery are things that are just like remnants of what he left behind. Mm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the literary stuff with the and connecting it to the cartoon, that seems like something that he might do. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah. are are they going to be able to like maintain it? Like with yeah. him not being there? And how will they execute it? Yeah. Because we did get to see a little bit of an ethical, moral dilemma here in the weaponizing of science. Yeah. Uh, normally it's more like a theme of an episode than like one monologue that one actor delivers just for like that one scene and then you're on to some of the biggest gore you've ever seen in Star Trek. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. So like so, parts of this were weird. But before we get gore. into that gore, let's uh, see if the computer has anything online. Um, someone was just talking about how the, the discussion around the science in Discovery didn't seem as exciting or even as confident as in other Star Trek series. Like mm-hmm. the actors mm-hmm. don't seem to have the same kind of grasp around the language mm-hmm. that some other Star Trek series. That's interesting, and I mean, it is early days on the show, and I know one of the ensigns in the first, in the pilot, was re- was like rambling off some some techno babble about the QEs being up and down the spectrum, mm-hmm. and I didn't believe a word of it. <laughs> it was like the Klingons, when they're saying noises they don't understand, yeah. it sounded like that actress was saying noises she didn't yeah, understand. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like early days in Star Trek, that's a certain amount of forgivable. Sure. But if we get deep into this season <laughs> and people still sound like they're saying noises when they're trying to speak science, um, <laughs> that's going to be a problem. Because some yes. of it's made up science, but some of it is not. Yes. Like, a lot of this is steeped in science. This isn't Star Wars s- s- science fantasy. This is science fiction, where we actually get to steep it in something real. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, where the foundation is from something mm-hmm. real. You know, even if it's altered. And I think that Michael Burnham, that character, when she speaks on science, um, it's really realistic to me. Like, I can, I, I believe it. I believe it when she, yeah. when she's saying things that she knows that is her knowledge. Like, I'm like, yeah, okay. I buy yeah, that. She, she's sort of <laughs> settled into this superiority thing yeah. that I like. Yes. I like that she knows she's better than everybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think that's kind of a neat spot to have her from. Although one thing I found really strange in this episode is that she described herself as a xenobiologist in the first mm-hmm. episode. And in this one, she has experience in high-level quantum mathematics. Oh. And I'm like, you just learned everything at this science academy, <laughs> I guess. That's how brilliant she it's is. Like, mate, but, and and the funny thing is, she <laughs> went to the science academy, but she does not have a Vulcan brain. She can't actually do the things Vulcans can do, because her physiology is still human, as evidenced by the fact that she estimated down to the second when a 
cloud was going to reach them and was off by an hour. <laughs> she, was, she was like not even close to the right answer. But she was like, oh, I estimate one hour, 49 minutes and 17 seconds. Oh shit, there it is. Like it was remarkable how much she's not able to do the thing she confidently said she could. And maybe that's just a cool thing about this character that she just. That's a likable thing about her for it's, sure. It's, it makes her a bit of like a Vulcan cowboy. And, and Tilly, and Tilly made her, makes her uh, more likable, doesn't it? Yes. Because yeah. Tilly brings out a softer, a, a more, I shouldn't say softer, she doesn't have to be but softer. they're a comedic duo yes, and she's right. a straight man. Yeah, that's And it right. works really well. Yeah. She, I, I would love it to be that Burnham is like, kind of like, she's half Spock, half Kirk. You know what I mean? Because, you know, you're right about Tilly bringing out, like, when she said, walks up to her and she's talking about her bunk and she says, seriously? That's like a Kirk thing, you know what I mean? Yep. Like, come on. Mm-hmm. And also just she's, when she's in the Jeffrey suit, and she that was so badass. That's that so that was remarkably badass. <laughs> yeah, that was really badass. So I'd like to, like, for uh, if it progresses, for her to be like that, like yeah. the combination of those and, two, and her be... unlikely flying leaps. Yeah. where she lands exactly where she needs to land. <laughs> Some kind of amazing mutant power. Because in the first in the first episodes, she goes through the vacuum of space. And on the other side <laughs> is just fine. She she thaws out in a second, and she looks just fantastic when she hits the bridge. Yeah. And it's like that shit would hurt you deep, deep oh. down inside. <laughs> that happened on Battlestar Galactica, and those people were in the hospital. Yeah. They were in, they were she's down in sick bay for like days. She's okay. using Vulcan meditation, right? Yeah, Vulcan meditation. <laughs> maybe it just wasn't quite as much of a distance they had to cover. <laughs> Although she was moving fast right into a metal door. That also impressed me. <laughs> but, yeah, going back to um, the, the science of the Orville, um, we're talking about uh, a much looser kind of science in the Orville, I think. Um, the fact that a ship could float through space and function for 2,000 years, I guess, says a lot about the construction of it. Uh, the idea of it being a generation ship, um, but one that uh, forgot its way... Is, is rooted deeply in scientific principles on how we could get to other stars if we can't move faster or approaching the speed of light. Um, the thing about it that I found a little bit not so believable was when the giant sky dome the sky dome breaks every like 45 minutes yes. and this thing has been around for 2,000 years and effortlessly opens up with a glass dome that for 2,000 years has been perfect. And can you imagine uh, no one the like shot their gun and, off. Can you imagine accident? the inhabitants? Yeah. Thinking, what, they pro- you know what? It would make and them it believe in night. God. I think it would probably make them believe in God yeah. more. Or at least in Liam Neeson. <laughs> yeah. I, it was night. That's scary. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. For 2,000 years, they've never had night. Yeah. Their circarkadian rhythms must have been wrecked. <laughs> yeah. Right? Poor people. You know, that's why they were so trigger happy. The yeah, Orville. they're just really on edge. This 2,000 year day has been just driving us nuts. Part of me when it opened. Because it's a comedy, and I'm always like, I wanted to be pushed a little further. <laughs> but it's excellent if it just was covered in dust. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. That's right. Yeah. Oh, just man. Well, I, I did love the idea that, um, to your question about the Prime Directive, yes. they are approaching a race yes. of people who are very agrarian. Yes. Mm-hmm. And yet, 2,000 years ago, developed the technology far beyond what the Orville was. Mm -hmm. So it really calls into question uh, if they did, even if they have a prime directive, I don't know, but it would call into question a prime directive moment because they just need to be trained into being who they are. (laughs) And and, and so it's not so much um, getting in the way of their development as reminding them of the development they've already had. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to remember what previous Star Trek shows did with people from other species, other cultures, who wanted change, uh, mm-hmm. wanted change that, that, that Star Trek, the Federation, would normally not want to engage in, right? Because well, Enterprise did an interesting uh, sort of arc with the, with the, Klingon, with the um, Vulcans, and the idea that the Vulcans were always holding back mm-hmm. humanity, didn't want humans to go out into space, even though they had this like fast and loose rule that if you've hit warp... You're one of us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they did not want the humans to go too far because yeah. we're cowboys. We adventure. <laughs> we <laughs> like to see what's out there. And I feel like that is what makes Star Trek work. Mm-hmm. I mean, Janeway was sad to be on the other side of the galaxy, but excited 
for what she was going to experience. For discovering. And, and having a wormhole right beside Cisco made him excited for what was going to happen. He had a new lease on life because of what he had experienced mm-hmm. in that pilot. He wanted that life. And and Picard always wanted to see what's out there. He yep. wanted an exciting adventure. And and Kirk <laughs> was just out there to to be a cowboy. <laughs> and I feel like all of that is the heart of what Star Trek has been. And the Orville is going on adventures. Yes. Discovery is doing something else. It's neat that it's yeah. that they've broken records according to Saru. They've got three hundred um they've got three hundred uh different different uh, is it scientific discoveries happening on that place, on that ship at the same time? Yeah. yeah. That's something interesting. Yeah. But it's they're being not... tested. They're being tested. Their, their, yeah. their ability to, to go mm-hmm. off on adventures is being... Um, yeah. I really you know. wonder what's going to happen with, uh, with <clears throat> Discovery being able to go on discoveries in I, this time of war. And I yeah. think that's one thing that's going to have to change. Actually, maybe two things are going to have to change. The science is going to have to be more um, uh, believable yeah. because it's such a big part of the survival of this. It's it's essential to the survival of this particular Star Trek Federation crew. Yeah. And two, they're going to have to start exploring at some point, somewhere, because that I think that's one thing that um, everyone expects from Star Trek and that mm-hmm. you probably can't get away with you know, leaving out. Yeah, yeah even Deep I'm Space Nine explored and they yeah. were on a space station yeah. that yeah, didn't go I'm anywhere. I was just wondering... Like what the choice was to call it discovery, discovery. and then yeah, <laughs> like that's the bummer is that it's actually called discovery and then there's not any discovering. Yeah, like, I like the tie-in of the Alice in Wonderland because that's like you know, that's a discovery kind of thing, but it's not like that's just her. That's not actually the crew doing that. Yeah, you know what I mean. And going back to the characters, this whole idea that Lorca is able to grant a prisoner a field commission. <laughs> a like, mutineer. A mutineer, and then yeah. Court-martialed. That's yeah. that life is a, sentence. Yeah, that yeah. is an interesting thing that I really hope <laughs> has some kind of repercussions. Because <laughs> that should not be, uh, you know, all that common. Being, being allowed to fight this war any way you want uh, is yeah. interesting. Uh, I just do not know about whether uh, I buy this, this either wh- whether it was Deus Ex Machina or specifically mm-hmm. going after Burnham. However, this occurred. I don't know that I buy this way of getting her out of this massive trouble. Mm-hmm. Why put her in this massive trouble in the, in first, the first place? Yeah. If you're just going to use a very tenuous, weak, <laughs> not very believable way yeah. of getting her out of it. Um, I didn't really buy that. That was a that was something unless that troubled me. Unless it will it better creep, pay off. Unless or it will creep back up again. Like it's if unless it's something that can be used against her in the future. Right? Yeah. It's like oh yeah, we needed you now, and now we don't need you anymore. Goodbye. You know. And I mean? with any luck, Lorca becomes a real bastard, <laughs> and they have to get rid of him. And there's a mutineer on the ship, <laughs> and it's like who's gonna listen to her if she's the one who's like we need to get rid of him. Uh, that might be something interesting to play into. I like the fact that Saru has this. Like, I will defend my captain no matter what thing yeah, with yeah, a yeah. captain that is kind <laughs> of a nasty dude. Yeah. And I feel like that's going to put us in a neat Burnham versus Saru situation again. Because mm. really, those were some of the only fun moments on in the first two hours of Discovery. Is it was play? the Saru and and Burnham play back and yes. forth. Which is harsh sometimes. Yep. And we, we talked about how... The, the characters were very harsh with each other, which was un, uh, the, unusual. Different. Yeah. And we also talked about the orgy of gore, right? Oh, my God. The, the amount of violence and... and oh, the immediate gore. violence. Like, this early, early violence, in the, even in the, in the mess hall. Yeah. Uh, was, and then yeah. once they get to the Her USS... once Yeah, the fighting was <laughs> yeah. great, but once they get to the USS Glenn, we are treated to a flavor of blood and guts and gore that reminded me of... The Event Horizon. Yeah, that's what it reminded me of. Right? Yeah, exactly. It was like just yeah. like body horror. Yeah. I've never seen gross. that on Star Trek. No, well, time. Star Trek has never not been on TV. And now that it's streaming, mm-hmm. now that it's on Netflix, mm-hmm. now that it's on space, on cable, it doesn't have to deal with network rules. Mm-hmm. The censorship isn't there in that same way. I don't think that's necessarily the direction they should be going as a general rule to give us so much really screwed up gore like a braided human body 
That was mm. weird, man. Not what I'm expecting from Star Trek. But even those battle scenes, just for the first... From the first, ep- for yeah. the first... Yeah. Just extended. Extended. Mm. And, and you were saying in the... Um, what we're used to seeing is, you know, post, pre or post. We don't yeah, actually we show up at watch the people destroying yeah. each other. Mm-hmm. So to watch people destroy each other that yeah. way for the, for the extended shots and extended scenes was actually a little bit t- t- um, tedious, a little bit tiresome. Yeah. I wanted it to be over. I yeah. wanted the violence mm-hmm. to, to, to be to, to be less. I hope that it is. I it want is. some I want some discovery. Yeah. I want, they they yeah. are it, with this like mushroom fungus transwarp thing they're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like there's a there's an opportunity to really go to some interesting places. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are some recognizable backgrounds mm-hmm. that uh, Burnham tra- like transwarped to or transwarped to the memory of. I don't know, because she could still hear the voice of mm-hmm. Lorca, so none of that really made a whole bunch of sense <laughs> no. to me. Mm-hmm. Other things that didn't seem to make sense was a breath machine oh, to open yes. the door. And, like, the, why? The and, but weird why did they make it so, And also, why did they make it so easy? Just make it less... Like, yeah, <laughs> make really that easy. One. That's really crap biometrics. <laughs> it's it's good to know. Um, I also I also found one like weird technical nitpick, is that if this show is going to be streaming online, then it means you need to be really good at video codecs, and CBS All Access, whatever it is that's happening with your video codecs, um, the very first moment where the discovery appears and that um, beautiful blue effect moves it through the uh, tractor beam and puts it into the cargo bay, um, that looked like garbage. <laughs> yeah. Like a blue muddled... Yeah, it was like a... Bl- stri- you, you couldn't really tell what was happening. No. Is that what did... Sorry. I'm yeah. sure it's I'm sure it's rendered beautifully <laughs> yeah. in a render farm in, in <laughs> somewhere in Ontario, but it looks like crap. <laughs> you got to be careful with your visual effects and the way in which you're going to deliver them to people because... The vi- the video game visual effects that I saw in the first two episodes mm-hmm. that just look like a cutscene from like Eve Online mm-hmm. like none of this stuff looks as high grade as it really should and mm-hmm. I don't know if it's because the design of the Discovery is a 1970s Macquarie design um, I'm not sure what it is about it but it They're doesn't feel to... as good as Voyager looked yeah. it doesn't well, look as good as yeah, Enterprise looked maybe it maybe it's murky. a failed attempt to make it seem less sophisticated than the oh. ships. Maybe. Than, than the, everything that came after. Although the <laughs> funny thing is... It, it didn't Star work. It yeah. didn't work. If you take a look at the the new effects that they've done for remastered episodes of the original series, those effects look beautiful. Ooh. And the oh, USS yeah, Enterprise really... 1701 looks beautiful in CGI. Are you talking yes. about the, the original, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. They remastered, they remastered them. They're nice. Yeah. They look gorgeous on the outside. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's almost a little bit too good. It's too a bit good. weird. It's a yeah. bit weird. Yeah. <laughs> it looks, it looks like... <laughs> Like too clean. The too yeah. clean. Yeah. It looks and it looks too modern yeah. compared to the. They, end, they the walked inside. a really interesting line, and as they this is totally off topic now, but <laughs> as the original series was remastered, they went in and did a little bit more, and then backed it off, and a little bit less to try to find a good balance of accentuating and not going full on George Lucas by like revising the whole damn series. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know they did it better some ways than others, but that's a good example of what Discovery could look like, if the Discovery. Is supposed to be a contemporary to Constitution class vessels. Mm-hmm. Not even a little bit trying. Can They're we, not trying. Can we talk about one thing that does happen in a lot of initial episodes of, Star, of the Star Trek shows? The trial. There's mm-hmm. um, often um, uh, either humanity is put on trial, mm-hmm. right? So uh, yeah. far point. Yeah. Uh, the ca- the well, I suppose in the cage. It was more about... Judgment already passed. Ju- yes. But, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, but uh, so in Farpoint and... Um, Supreme uh, beings yes. like to do that to, to people. The same sort of thing happens with the emissary with yeah. the, emissary with the wormhole. Like, that's right. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so that's a thing. That, that is, uh, that is a, a through point. Yeah. A, yeah. Through, a through line. Yeah. In and really, the, the, the Roddenberry question of whether we are worthy of this. Mm-hmm. And the answer is always yes, we are. The thing about Battlestar Galactica was mm-hmm. that there was a point where the share, where Sharon and Adama have that conversation yes. about whether you are worth saving. Yeah. Are you worthy of survival? Yeah, maybe, and that maybe comes you up aren't. In, in the issue a lot, mm-hmm. but it, I mean, it, it's done differently. It's revealed through a, like more conflict mm-hmm. than Star Trek is. Where yes. Yeah, and Star Trek always cuts to the side of, yes, you are worthy. Mm-hmm. And I'm feeling more and more like Discovery is cutting to the side of, not worthy. In like 
you're bad people doing bad things to, to try to attack other bad people who are doing mm-hmm. bad things to you. Like, there are no good guys in this war. It's like a sign of the, maybe it's a sign of the times, I don't know, but... Maybe, um, yeah. <laughs> which is unfortunate, but... And, and it, it sucks because that takes the aspirational aspect out of, of it. Something was, that the yeah. Orville is able to give us that aspirational look at, 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 at humanity. And again, if I had to compare episode three of Discovery to episode four of the Orville, mm-hmm. the trekkiest episode... <laughs> Was Orville. It was definitely the Orville. Yes. What do, it, what do you think? Between tr- Trek and a Wreck-It, let's switch this over to well, uh, our happy red our, our red ones. There we go. Ooh, All right. <laughs> did did we Trek it or did we wreck it when we when we were watching Discovery? Maybe for for Discovery? Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to say um, a tentative, like a cautious trek it. <laughs> okay. I, 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 yeah, I... I, I cautious okay but that's only because of certain basically um certain conversations between certain characters like again like how i said in the the pilot like the responsibility that she took it's only very specific things like her conversation with saru and their about um their captain and Mm -hmm. that sort of thing and how he stepped up and for her you know and vouched for her to me, was very Star Trek, and her relationship with Tilly was also very mm-hmm. Star Trek, and how that progressed. Um, even her moment through the Jeffrey's tube, that literary connection, all that is like very Star Trek to me. But you know, they did they missed some points. It's like it's very violent, like her beating a bunch of people up in the mess hall and not really having any consequences of that mm-hmm. is awkward for Star Trek, definitely. Mm-hmm. And the violence on the sh- on the Glen was yeah. It's more like a Ferengi so, ship. It's more like a yeah. Ferengi ship. <laughs> or a Klingon, a Klingon ship. ship. So what do you think what when it comes think, to Trek to direct it for Discovery? I think the part where it was Trek was where she's talking to Lorca and she is um, uh, she is uh, rejecting his mm-hmm. request to go on it mm-hmm. and she shows it she shows that it's because she believes so much in, as in her Starfleet role. Mm-hmm. She believes so much in herself mm-hmm. as a Starfleet uh, officer. Yeah, that responsibility. Mm-hmm. Yes, and so so um, I actually think that they trekked it just because it, it's 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 a dark mission. It's a uh, it's a rogue mission. It feels like, mm-hmm. but uh, they are they do seem to be on a mission. Okay, and they mm-hmm. and it does seem like they're headed. In, in toward discovery, the discovery of something that will allow them to survive, and who knows what else. Okay. So, hmm. so um, but now what about the Orville? Would yes. you say the Orville? Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. More. What about more. you? Did the yeah, Orville track? Yeah, it does. Yes. All right. But I, so I unqualified, the Orville yes, tracked it. Yeah. yeah, I always say the discovery. It seems like it's. I'm being very cautious, and the Orville is very easy for me to say they tracked it, and I'm, I'm also cautious about that because I don't know if they're so just tapping easy. into. Yeah. My nostalgia, like it's tapping in. I'm always like very wary of something that taps so heavily into my nostalgia that That's I don't know fair. if it's real or you know mm-hmm. or not. You know what I mean? Yeah. I have to remind myself that like look at the other aspect to see if it's sincere, and it seems well, pretty sincere. I've got to agree that that the Orville 100 percent trekked it. Yeah. Like it was everything I ever want from a Star Trek episode, and then extra Liam Neeson. <laughs> yeah. So like that was all great. But when it comes to Discovery, um, between the suspiciously villainous captain <laughs> and the gore uh, on the Glen and the fact that we are still discovering nothing. There is, <laughs> there is no discovery happening. There's like weaponizing some some science, which I thought was almost, we were getting close to Trek and then we veered away mm. to go look at gore and for Klingons to shush people. And Rekha Sharma, I enjoyed her as this like, this rough... Mm-hmm. character it's so different than what she did on Battlestar so that's fun yeah. but she just brought me back to this whole idea that oh I'm not watching Star Trek I'm watching Battlestar Galactica yeah because I'm they... watching something else oh yeah yeah exactly. I don't feel like I'm watching Star Trek so for me discovery I agree we're I, getting closer I agree, but... but this did not track okay. okay so can we call it Star Trek, Trek something else Star Trek, yeah. n- n- um, uh, what, w- what would we call it? Let's not call Let's it Discovery co- until they're discovering something. Yeah. I, have a hard, I have a hard time calling it Star Trek. I have a hard time calling it Discovery. I don't know what to call it. It's a problem. Cautious Trek. Cautious Trek. Cautious Trek. Yeah. Cautious cautious trek. Cautious yeah. trek. Or if we just cautiously call it, trekking. We're cautiously yeah. trekking. We could just call it Battle Star Wars. Yeah, right. Like, so far, it's better at being Star Wars and better at being Battlestar Galactica than it is at being Star Trek. Definitely the, the, the visuals. We're, we're very yeah. reminiscent of uh, Star Wars. Very Star, Star Wars, Wars visuals, yeah. yeah. I, I, I do find it hard to believe that the 
like the crew of Battlestar Galactica seems more they like they like each other more than people on Star Trek. Yeah, like, Discovery. That's nobody, very fair. They don't fair. like each other. They really don't. Seem like, to Tilly like each and other. Tilly and Burnham like each other now, but they nobody likes each other. Everybody seems like they can't stand each other. Yeah. You know, but they, <laughs> and and that's right. And that's another thing. That's one thing. That's right. That came to mind before. In the Orville, there was time yep. to show them bonding, mm-hmm. to show them having a relationship. And we haven't seen that on Discovery, so it's hard to care yeah. about them. It's hard yeah. to Well, yeah. And, we, and I, we've had one hour on the Discovery because we've already blown up the Shenju and yeah. everyone on it. Yeah. And we've got four hours now of the Orville, mm-hmm. who they are, what they do, and how they interact Maybe with each other. Maybe we shouldn't be comparing them. Well, you, I think no. they must be compared. They have to be compared. It is essential to compare these two things. To bring Discovery in line. Is Exa- that what we're trying to May- do that? I don't know if we're going to be able to bring Discovery in line because Discovery's doing its own thing. And this is not to say that I'm not enjoying Discovery. Yes. Mm. I mean, I'm not enjoying Discovery, but there are parts, there are parts of it where... There are parts of it where I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Oh, this could become a good show. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, Star Trek The Next Generation was not a great show for three years. It was a good show. Yes. But it was not a truly great show until it hit that third year. Yeah. When when Riker got a beard. Growing a beard. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) Everyone got collars. Shit got great. Um, Deep Space Nine. Three years before it gets good. Voyager, three years. And then three more years. And then another year. All bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, yes. The premise but, of Voyager was just... Yeah. What's just like Battlestar Galactica. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. And plus, Battlestar Galactica was about to do it better. So and what about the theme song for Enterprise? Can okay. we at least say that the theme songs for these two shows are better than the theme song for Enterprise? Well, we I, haven't I, talked about the Discovery theme at all. Well, I mean, why do you have to? It's the, the original <laughs> series theme. <laughs> Like, it's not like anyone wrote a theme it's for this. a little different. Nobody wrote a theme for this show, right? They just, like, patched it into... Yeah. In fact, I, um, my wife was saying that uh, it sounds like you start watch, listening to Star Trek, then you listen to The Crown, and then you go back to listening to Star Trek. The whole time I'm looking at it, I'm thinking of the Fringe, and which reminds me of JJ. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, no. Yeah. It's, I don't know. I don't think it's much of a theme. Having said that... Uh, yes, a, Ro- a, a Rod Stewart rock song at the beginning of a Star Trek show is a bit weird. Um, I kind of liked it. It's got its charm. <laughs> it's got it was charm. hopeful. It was hopeful. It That's was. True. It, was it, it brings, like, <laughs> tears to my eyes every time I see the opening of Enterprise, but it doesn't feel like the opening of a Star Trek show. Sure. Okay. The way you open a Star Trek show is beautiful shots of the ship or craft <laughs> and beautiful music. That's what you do. And you know what's Seth MacFarlane? You got it. <laughs> no, so, no, I don't really. I don't mind the diagram, uh, discovery diagrams. So. Yeah, I don't either. It's interesting. Yeah. It's different. Again, not Star Trek. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit Purist? of a harsh critic on this. I like but, it, though. I but mean, here's the thing. Know. I'm optimistic, and I'm going to keep watching this, and I am paying for CBS All Access. <laughs> I'm going to watch this show because I believe that yeah. Star Trek must be on the air. And you know, I, in I our, totally agree. Right? Especially, yeah. especially now. And the absolute worst it. case, it is. It's called the Orville. <laughs> so right. we've got oh. some Star Trek, and at least one of them is on television. <laughs> so that, to me, means we're in a good place. Star Trek is back, in a way. And I'm I'm all in because I haven't had two Star Trek shows I can watch <laughs> yeah. in like 15 years, yeah. and I'm just in my glory. So That's I'm true. watching both of them. I'm enjoying this entire experience. I am pretty pumped about that. Yes. Right? And our viewers have something to watch on Monday nights, too. Exactly. And participate in. And Not they don't can be a part of this. Participate. Yeah. So, yes, and I think we have. And anything else, uh, anything else online, computer? Uh, well, uh, Derek agrees with the Orville Trek did. He also thinks that Lorca is part of Section 31. So perhaps Ooh, There's a big time. Yes, yeah, Section 31. Yeah. I'm glad someone mentioned it. Have you ever seen a black badge before? <laughs> right? So there's some... Sec- Although the funny thing about that is, in that moment... Burnham's walking around with a black rubber badge on her. So it's like, yeah, any other color yeah. would have worked. Wardrobe, come on, any other color. But yeah, that black badge thing was very interesting. Mm. I really enjoyed the fact that, yes, Derek, I think you're right. There's some Section 31 stuff going on. Um, and that I, I've always enjoyed in the odd episode. Like when Section 31 sure. gets involved in some stuff with the Defiant and you're doing stuff at war, yeah. that works. Um, the fact that this whole show is a war show, um, I think we're going to see some Section 31, Derek. I think well, you're right. I, def- I agree. I, the first thing I thought, I was like, when I'm trying to figure out the show, 
I, the first thing I thought was, this is an espionage ship? Like, right? is that mm-hmm. what this is? Is so this I the totally Pegasus? Agree there. Is what I was thinking yeah. the whole time. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. if if you remember from the pe- the episode of the Pegasus, not Battlestar's no, Pegasus, no. but Star Trek's Pegasus, <laughs> the Next Generation, um, there's that ship that's having an experimental cloaking device, and like the shit you're not supposed to do, it's against the Geneva Conventions. Yes. And so I feel like we're Which treading on up. that. We're yeah. absolutely treading on that here. Um, it's not the Star Trek show I was expecting with the name Discovery. If it was, if it was called Didn't Star it? Trek War Zone. Yeah, or Star Trek Klingon War, or Star Trek <laughs> Blood Guts and Battle. Like, <laughs> then you'd be like, "Yeah, that's the show I signed up for." If they had for. just picked any other name, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Zombie, zombie Star, Star Trek. Trek. Yeah, yeah. Star Trek: The Walking Dead. Like <laughs> anything like that. Yeah. With Sinequa. Like, yeah, Sinequa was in it already. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just, I just feel like we're we're watching a new flavor of Star Trek. Yeah. Um, and it's a more it's a it's a far more different flavor than Star Trek has ever had, and maybe it's because it wasn't a bunch of relays and tag team this Star Trek to that Star Trek. Right. We've had a break, and Star Trek is trying to catch up with the world the way it is. Mm. And the question really is, should it? Because on the Orville, they're just doing what Star Trek does best, right. and I think it's beautiful. And what Discovery is doing is intriguing, mm-hmm. but it sure is, it's not beautiful. Yeah, like will it help? Humanity. Like, yeah, the way Star Trek has in the past. That's the thing. Will it actually help Star us? Trek gives us the first yeah. <laughs> interracial kiss on television, mm-hmm. the first lesbian kiss on television. It gives us a way to ways to consider the civil rights movement. It gives yeah. us ways to deal with gender. It lets us look at the world in beautiful, different ways. Mm-hmm. And then we could be changed after an hour of television. Yes, yeah. yes. And, that's one thing that's, that's missing from both of these shows. The Orville is more Trek, and it's very mm-hmm. entertaining. Uh, but... Um, Still, that's one thing that's missing for me. Uh, TNG, especially, was extreme. Use the word aspirational, mm-hmm. and it made me. It it, it looked like it, pro- it it provided for me a life, a way mm-hmm. of living that I would want. Yeah, definitely. Oh, if I could, if I could have been one of I'd, the officers, I'd work on that ship. Yes, for sure. I'd be an ensign. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. Being a Starfleet officer was definitely <laughs> sure. um, uh, something to to, uh, to to aspire to. to. Aspire to. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, guys, I, yeah. I think I think we can agree that the Orville trekked it. Yes, we we're a little clear <laughs> on whether cautious, Discovery did. Cautious, cautious. Okay. I'm going to say no. <laughs> they're going to say yes. So a little bit. A little bit. So next week on Monday, we will be back to talk about episode five of the Orville and episode four of Discovery. Mm-hmm. We're going to keep this pattern up every Monday. So join us. We're going to be on at nine o'clock. Eastern Standard Time to talk about this. We love having you comment. It's been a lot of fun, and we're going to do this weekly. It's going to make Star Trek last all week, (laughs) and that makes us happy. So we'll see you guys there.